The psalmist bids us walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers, consider well her ramparts, go through her citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will guide us forever. We're going to begin by singing number 570 in our blue books. A hymn that speaks of the glories of Zion, the city of God, and of our God whose word can never be broken. Number 570, glorious things of you are spoken.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. It is with joy, O Lord our God, that we bow before you, the great God of heaven, the King of the ages, the one who is truly our God forever and ever. And how we rejoice, Lord, to know that by your grace alone we have been called to be citizens of your kingdom, to inherit a home that is everlasting in the city that is designed and built by your own hand for your own people out of the love of your own heart that you might dwell with us and among us forever and that we might be brought home to the place where we belong brought home to our father in heaven the father we had scorned and rejected and rebelled against because our hearts are so hardened and we're so determined to be the rulers and the leaders of our own lives to break free and yet what a mess we have made of this world of our lives of everything good and beautiful that you have made and our selfishness our sinful hearts have so ruined the beauty of this your world and so Lord we thank you for your grace and mercy in our Lord Jesus Christ that you came to restore that was lost to mend that which is broken to draw back even our rebellious hearts that we might have our eyes open to the wonders of your love and to see that your yoke is not burdensome but that your way is the way of life and beauty and wholesomeness and the way of peace. So, Lord, teach us your way, we pray. We know that even though we love you, even though you have redeemed us and saved us and called us your own, we know that still lurks in our hearts so much that is wrong, so much that turns us away from you day after day. How we grieve, O oh God, at the sin that grieves your heart. Forgive us, Lord. And as we draw near this morning together, as your people, draw near to us and speak to us that you might lead us in the way everlasting and that we might learn to live day by day lives that so treasure that which is solid and lasting your glorious heavenly kingdom that here even in this earth we would show by our lives as well as by what is on our lips the glory and the beauty of heaven and the joy of knowing our Lord Jesus Christ so hear us Lord and help us for we ask it in Jesus name Amen Well, we uh, have a baptism this morning, and uh, so I'm going to say a little word about that before I ask Terry and Charlene and little James McCutcheon to come up and join me on the platform here. Listen to the words of the institution of the sacrament of baptism as they're delivered by our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples after he, ascend after he was raised and just before he ascended to the right hand of the Father in heaven. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. You therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, Jesus is speaking of what the prophets had long foretold of the day when the Messiah would do a new thing on earth, no longer just chiefly among the Jewish people, but for people of every tribe and language and nation, a people called out by God to be cleansed and renewed by the grace of the gospel fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. 
So Ezekiel, the prophet, had said, I will sprinkle clean water on you in that day and you shall be clean. I shall give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And the prophet Joel likewise said, in those days I will pour out my spirit upon you. And the sacrament of baptism thus instituted is the sign and the seal of God's covenant of grace with his people in this new age, the age of the Spirit. And it speaks of the fulfillment once and for all through Jesus Christ of all the repetitive washings and sprinklings of, that we read about in the Old Testament. It speaks of our engrafting into Christ through the once and for all forgiveness that comes to us through his sprinkled blood speaks of the regeneration by the pouring out of his Holy Spirit when he ascended to the glory of heaven. And therefore, it preaches to us the joyful message of true adoption and of resurrection to everlasting life that is the promise for all who are his. Now, although little children do not yet understand these things, yet the promise is also to them. Children born to believing parents have by their birth an interest in this gospel covenant. They are heirs of the covenant of grace. They're set apart as holy by God's gracious providence, as the Apostle Paul says to the Corinthian church. And therefore, they are entitled to the seal of that covenant, which is baptism. There's nothing magic about this act. It's simply a visible word of that gospel of grace. And in the sacrament, God is saying once again, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, let these little children come to me and do not hinder them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And Christian parents are simply hearing these words and saying, yes, so we want it to be for our little one also. And so this covenant act of baptizing a helpless infant is a standing witness to the priority of grace over faith in the Christian life. And so in baptizing this little one, we are declaring to the whole world the true gospel, that what God does for us, he does without our merit. He does indeed without even our knowledge. Perhaps in baptism, more plainly than anywhere else, we see that God commends his love towards us, as Paul says, in that while we were still without strength, Christ died for us. So it is that in the word of the gospel, God's grace comes to us freely before waiting for any response on our part. And yet, of course, God's word of promise never comes to us without also calling for a response on our part. It calls us always to the obedience of faith. In due time, from the little one himself. But already and now, from his parents. And so this word that we proclaim today in baptism is not a word that we can treat lightly. It calls for real faith. It calls for real trust. God has promised great and gracious things to Christian parents and we're to take him seriously by trusting his word and by trusting God in bringing up our little ones in faith and not fear. Indeed, God's word commands us as Christian parents that we must bring up our little ones in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. And that's why it's the duty of those who bring their little ones for baptism to confess the faith into which they are to be baptized. And so I'm going to ask Terry and Charlene to come and join me here and to confess that faith before you all. Now Terry and Charlene, and especially you Terry, as under God the head of this household of faith and the leader of your family. James depends chiefly on you, both of you, for all the encouragement and all the help that he needs. And so in presenting James for baptism, do you confess, both of you, your trust in God as your heavenly Father and in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? So do you do promise then, depending on divine grace, to teach James the truths and duties of Christian faith and by prayer and precept and example, 
to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. All of us also who are gathered here as the household of faith in this church, we also bear responsibilities for this little one, and we also are called to play our part in his nurture and his training in the ways of Christ by our prayers and by our commitment to his parents and by our example. And so to acknowledge our part in all of that, I'm going to ask all of us as a congregation to stand with Terry and Charlene. And so James, as your parents claim for you both the privileges and the great responsibilities of bearing the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and belonging to his family, this church. James, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit in the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and be with you all the days of your life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so, friends, according to Christ's commandment, James is now received into the family and the fold of this church, engaged as it is to set apart himself and to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and to grow into that faith into which he's been baptized, and so to be the servant, and we trust the soldier of Christ all the days of his life. And as we stand here, then let's pray together. Lord God, our God and Father, the God of eternal covenant promises to us in Jesus Christ, your Son, would you grant all of us here this morning the faith to be true to what we've promised. And may this precious family and indeed this whole church family grasp, hold and seize upon these wonderful tokens of your abundant grace that we have here today. And so appropriate them with gladness and joy that what is done today in marking out this little one as yours may indeed come to full fruition as he grows and is nurtured in Christ from his earliest days. And so live for the glory and honor of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And as we remain standing, we sing together the hymn on the screens, Gracious Savior, Gentle Shepherd, Little Ones Are Dear to Thee. Just, just, stay for the first bit.
Well, let me uh, warmly welcome all of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, and uh, very particularly if it's your first time, then uh, we're very glad indeed to welcome you uh, to the Fellowship uh, of the Tron Church. Uh, we meet again this evening. Uh, the service is here in Bar Street at 6.30. And uh, if you're able to join us uh, again, we'd love to see you and to share fellowship together. You should have received on the way in or found on your chair one of these uh, sheets with uh, some notices. Uh, I won't go through them all. You'll see there are numbers of things on during the week this week, as always. Uh, a couple of notices down at the bottom on the right-hand side, dates for your diary to remember, uh, particularly the 1st of June. That will be our uh, chance to meet together for an annual uh, congregational meeting as we look back on the year past and look forward and uh, pray together. So do put that in your diary and come along and uh, hear about uh, new plans for the future and uh, as we review the year together. Also, you'll see at the bottom, next Saturday is a special day for James and Grace, and uh, I'm sure you'll have them in your prayers, and uh, they would be delighted if you want to join them uh, for their wedding service here in the church at 12 o'clock noon. Now, uh, also, you'll find in your sheets, uh, a blue sheet, I think, as uh, there was last week, which is uh, talking about the Sponsor a Chair program. As I mentioned last week, we are hoping to... Uh, get a lot more chairs for the new building at Kelvin Grove. We've more or less enough chairs to uh, suit the morning congregation meeting there at the moment. They're pretty tatty and old, but uh, that's all right. We manage. But there aren't enough chairs for all of us to get together there, and we do want to do that uh, on occasion. And uh, in particular, uh, we want to do that in June for our service of ordination for Paul Brennan. And uh, I'm sure you'll all want to come along to that to support Paul and to hear Dick Lucas, uh, who will be our guest preacher. So uh, we need to get a whole lot more chairs, and um, the details are there. And we thought it would be great if everybody could think about sponsoring a chair. Now, let me just make very clear. Uh, I was in um, London the other week, and I, I wandered into Southwark Cathedral uh, to see, uh, just to see the inside of the building. I'd never uh, seen inside it before. And... Um, Interestingly, they had chairs exactly the same as uh, these chairs, the chairs we're going to be buying. They had wooden ones. And I noticed that on the back of each chair, there was a little um, plaque. And I, I couldn't quite see them, so I looked at the chairs. And each one of these chairs was sponsored by some company or other. Let me just make very clear, you will not have a plaque on the back of the chair, no matter how many chairs you sponsor. Um, that's not what we're going to do. But uh, you'll have the satisfaction of knowing you've provided a seat, not just for yourself, but uh, hopefully for somebody else uh, to come and hear the gospel. And one more piece of very good news. I have uh, had high-level negotiations this week at the very highest level in Whitehall, and I can confirm to you that if you are able to sponsor four seats, then the Chancellor of the Exchequer will give us one for free. <laughs> it's called gift aid. <laughs> but he has promised unfailingly that that is the case. So every four, we get the fifth one free. So how about that? So even if you can sponsor one, well, we'll get a quarter of another chair for nothing uh, if you're able to gift aid the money. So let's uh, do all we can together and let's see if we can seat a great company of people towards the end of June for that meeting and we hope for many other such gatherings uh, afterwards. And you've opportunity every Sunday this month uh, to make your donations uh, to sponsor a chair, but no plaques on the back of the chairs, please. Actually, uh, we're going to turn to our Bibles now to read, and it just reminds me of a story that uh, Peter Adam, who was once the principal of uh, uh, Ridley College in Melbourne, and who was with us uh, this time uh, last year in June speaking at our uh, conference and preaching to us here, you'll remember him, and he was once on the uh, board of a, a, an organization that were looking to uh, put up a building, and there were many, many people who had sponsored, and a great plaque was going to be put on the wall with the names of all the people who had uh, sponsored and given money towards this building. And the board uh, looked at him and said, uh, Dr. Adam, could you think of an appropriate text uh, to put beside this great list of names of all those who have sponsored? And he immediately said, oh, yes, I can think of a very good one indeed. Matthew chapter 6, verse 2b. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. <laughs> well... That's not the kind of reward we're looking for, as we're going to discover as we read these verses. We're going to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 24, page 811, if you have one of our church Bibles. Beware, says the Lord Jesus, beware of doing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give... 
Give to the needy. Sorry, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who sees in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, the pagans, for they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You then pray like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moss and moth and rust destroy, and where their thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Amen. May God bless to us his word. Well, as the musicians play and our offerings are received, you might like to uh, ponder these words that we've read together and perhaps look at the uh, handout uh, that we'll be studying uh, in just a few moments.
I've just spotted you over there, Stephen, and uh, Stephen Kiria, and uh, his wife Ruby and son Timothy, who have just this last week uh, joined them after many, many years of separation from Ghana. It's a delight to see you here with us. We've been praying much for you, and we're thrilled at this uh, great reunion that's taken place. Let's give thanks to God together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the wonderful reunion that you have brought to Stephen, our brother here, that we have prayed with him about over many, many months and indeed years. How we thank you for the joy of this family brought back together. And we praise you and thank you for all that you have done. We pray for them as they now live together here as a family and ask that you would bless them richly and encourage them and help them. Pray for Ruby and Timothy as they get used to our culture and our weather and all the things that are so different uh, from Africa. How we praise you, our Heavenly Father, for the tender care and love you have for every one of your children, our very hairs unnumbered. And you see us and you know us and you love us. And we thank you, Lord, that we have such a tender, loving Heavenly Father before whom we can pray in the midst of a world that is so uncertain, so changeable, that so often makes us fear with trepidation for the future, as we hear news from all around the world of terrible happenings, frightening things, and as we feel so small and so much caught up in great forces that we have so little control over. We think of our own landlord in this week of elections here in Scotland and throughout the United Kingdom in different ways. We come before you to pray for those who will govern us in the months and the years to come at different levels, local councils, in the Scottish Parliament, in the Welsh and Northern Irish Assemblies, and of course the government at Westminster also. We pray, Lord, for truth and righteousness to be upheld in our land, that our rulers would know that you have placed them in authority to promote and to reward that which is good and to prevent and also to punish where evil is done. We pray, Lord, for great wisdom among our leaders that they might look to the truth of God to know what is right and what is evil. In our land, Lord, where there is so little understanding of your ways and your word, we cry to you that your church might be strong, far, far stronger and clearer, its message louder and heard in every place, that those in this nation might know the truth that is in Jesus Christ might know the words of righteousness and the ways of righteousness that alone can exalt a nation and prevent it slipping into decay. So, Lord, we ask for ourselves, as we ask for every such gathering of your people in our city, in our nation, and all throughout these islands this day, that wherever there are those who name the name of Jesus Christ and call themselves Christian people, and there would be true kingdom perspective that we and all who name the name of Christ might see this world and our lives, our responsibilities, our opportunities, everything that you give us, that we might see it in the light of your glorious coming kingdom, which alone is everlasting. So hear us, Lord, we pray. And open our eyes and our hearts now as we come to your word. May we meet you and hear you and go on our way, sure and certain that we have heard the words of the living God and we have been shown the way in which we are to walk every day of this coming week. So draw near to us, Lord, and speak. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to God's words then, we sing the hymn on the screens, which is a prayer. Now in reverence and awe, we gather round your word. In wonder, we draw near.
Well, please turn again in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, page 811. And we're looking particularly at verses 19 to 24 today, uh, which are verses all about living with true kingdom perspective. We continue our study in the, sermons on the uh, Sermon on the Mount, where uh, Jesus himself is teaching all true followers and all would-be followers uh, what it really means to be a Christian, to live as a disciple of Christ. And having begun in the Beatitudes, those pithy uh, sayings, uh, which lay out uh, in an in inimitable fashion the, uh, the, the marks of Christ's true people, uh, Jesus shows that it's, it's a portrait, isn't it, of lives that are shaped by the grace and mercy of God in Christ, and lives that therefore share in the experience of Christ. And then he goes on immediately to talk about the mission uh, of Christ's true people. They are to be ambassadors who uh, shed the light of God's heaven here on earth and point people uh, to the Father in heaven as Jesus himself did. And uh, from chapter 5, verse 17, right through to midway through chapter 7, we have uh, a very detailed exposition then of what I've been calling the manners of Christ's people. It's what the, the practice of true Christianity must be like for all those who bear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And through chapter 5, we've been seeing that true kingdom righteousness is what it's all about. A true kingdom morality that is lived out by those who have truly heavenly relationships here on earth. Lives that are touched and shaped by the ways of the kingdom of heaven. And that is visible and tangible here on earth, principally in the relationships that Christ's people have, the relationships among God's people, but also between them and uh, the people of the world. And the climax at the very end of chapter 5 sums it all up in verse 48. We are to be perfect with the wide, inclusive, uh, generous-hearted love and purity and faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. Be perfect, of course, doesn't mean uh, morally faultless. Jesus knows very well that we are not morally uh, perfect in that way. But what he is meaning is that we are to be complete. We are to be wholesome. We are to be expansive, all-embracing in our love, in our purity, in our faithfulness, just as our Heavenly Father is. Our righteousness really is to reflect the things that truly characterize our Heavenly Father. And to live like that, then, is the evidence that we do actually have a relationship, a right relationship with God himself, with God our Heavenly Father. And in fact, to live like that is the only evidence that that really is so. And that right relationship, that righteousness, must be expressed in right relationships with others in the world, those around us, in our lives, those with whom we deal with day to day, those whoever we come into contact with in our lives here on earth. But, and this is very important, there is danger in this teaching. Just as the, the scribes and the Pharisees manipulated and therefore neutralized the true challenge and the morality of the law of Moses, and they turned it into a religious bondage, so also it would be possible to pervert even this exposition of heart righteousness and kingdom life that Jesus himself gives us here. It would be possible to take that and to turn it into mere religious hypocrisy and sham. Don Carson is, is right when he says, the greater the demand for holiness, the greater the potential for hypocrisy and self-deception. Now just think about that and we know how true it is. The human heart is deceitful above all things. That's what Jeremiah the prophet tells us. And our capacity to deceive ourselves even exceeds our capacity at times uh, to deceive others, doesn't it? Especially in this whole realm of outward piety, of religious behavior. It can be made to cloak underneath something that is vain and empty and false. But it can be hidden 
underneath a cloak of religious respectability. And that's why Jesus goes right on from chapter 5 into Matthew chapter 6 to show that not only must we grasp the heart of God's law of righteousness, not only must we get a grip of that searching, piercing nature of true kingdom morality, but we must also get a grip on what it means to have a true kingdom mentality and heart and spirit out of which that true righteousness must come. And that's why the first word of chapter 6 is beware. Beware, says Jesus. It's not just obedience to Jesus. It's not just doing his radical commands for holiness that counts. It's all about the motivation for doing these things. Yes, real righteousness of the kingdom is expressed in a true kingdom morality. Real heavenly relationships here on earth. But the truth is that will only be real if it is evoked and is born out of a true kingdom mentality. We'll only live our lives day by day displaying these heavenly relationships on earth if we're living with real heavenly priorities in our hearts day by day all the time. And Jesus knows our hearts. So there's no room, is there, for hypocrisy with Jesus. He's not interested at all in outward show. He sees right to the very heart. Religion, of course, is so often about outward show, but Jesus says kingdom righteousness must be lived out from the heart. It's from the heart. Remember, he says in Matthew 15, we've quoted it several times, it's from the, the sinful, natural human heart that comes so much that defiles a person so much that's sinful and wrong. But likewise, it is also from a heart that is, is touched and changed by God's grace and possessed and, and directed by Christ's Holy Spirit, it's from a heart like that that precedes the righteousness that is the true life of heaven, the life of heaven flowing into this dark world through Christ's people as we live out heavenly ways now in the midst of this earthly life. And that is the mark of real kingdom people, according to Jesus, real disciples, real Christians. It's what the prophets looked for in the days of the new covenant, as we read a little earlier. That the law of God would be truly enfleshed, that it would be embedded, written deep within the heart of God's redeemed people. The law would be planted within them by the spirit of, of triumphant holiness, the spirit of the risen, vindicated, perfect human being, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of heaven, the new man, the new humanity. That spirit poured into our hearts. So we could sum it up this way. True kingdom righteousness is all about love from the heart and love for the Father. That's what we see in the earthly life of the Lord Jesus, the perfect Son of the Father. And he calls each one of us who is born again by his Spirit, who is born from above, who is born uh, with a heavenly birth, he calls us to share that heart righteousness, to love truly from the heart and to love truly the Father in heaven. And that's the key to all Christian living as we live lives in the kingdom that Jesus has begun on earth and as we wait for its final consummation when he comes at last to reign. Seeing for whom we're living and who we're not living for and to please and seeing what we're living for and what we're not living for in terms of gain and reward. That's the key to life today for us as Christians, in our work, in our careers, in our family, in our relationships, in all the, the priorities that we face in life. And so this next section of the Sermon on the Mount from chapter 6 verse 1 right through to chapter 7 verse 12, it helps us to get it all clear and plain, it helps us to understand what it means to have this heavenly mentality, what it means for heavenly realities to be in control of our hearts. And remember, when the Bible speaks about our hearts, it doesn't mean uh, our feelings and our emotions just. The Bible <coughs> thinks of the heart as the very center of our being, our control center, our thoughts, our, our words, all our actions. It's our mentality, in a sense, our attitude. 
And again, Matthew has carefully organized this material with this crucial teaching of Jesus to give a great sense of balance and of symmetry. He does that to aid our understanding. He does it so many places throughout his gospel, and and it helps us see how everything hangs together. And I've, I've put it on a handout for you, just diagrammatically, and if you look at that, you'll see, I think, Uh, how Matthew wants us to understand this. The key point is right in the middle. That was often the way in uh, the more ancient teaching. It wasn't sort of headlines at the top, like you get in the newspaper headline and then the detail. Often, the heart of the thing was in the middle. And that's the key point here. And verses 19 to 24 really sum up the whole section and hold it all together. It's the key for everything that goes before, verses 1 to 18, and everything that comes after, from verse 25 down to chapter 7, verse 12. So these verses are about showing us true kingdom perspective and what that means for all of life. And then that is what will govern all of our thinking about true kingdom piety. Chapter 6, verses 1 to 18, things that we think of in our devotional life where he talks about prayer and fasting and giving and that sort of thing. And that kingdom perspective will also govern our thinking about our true priorities in all of our daily life. And that's the sort of thing Jesus speaks about from verse 25 right down to chapter 7, verse 12. Practical issues like food and drink and clothes and our daily needs and how we think about other people, our perception of them. And also our perseverance in our Christian walk with God. So if you like, to put it simply, we need to live with a true kingdom perspective to guide our daily worship in relation to God and to guide our daily walk uh, in relation to the world. That's the shape, I think, uh, of this section. We're going to look at it in some detail over the next uh, two or three weeks. But today I want to focus on this key paragraph, verses 19 to 24, which press home the kingdom mentality which is perhaps our best way of thinking about the attitude of mind and heart that Jesus wants us to think about. And that true kingdom mentality begins when we have learned to live with true kingdom perspective, true kingdom sight. You see, these verses are all about having a healthy eye. They're all about seeing clearly, having a right outlook on life. That is heaven's outlook on life, and not earth's outlook on life. And you'll only do that, says Jesus, if heaven is rooted deeply in your heart. If your heart and mind and will, your whole mentality is being molded and shaped in every respect, not by earth, but by the heavenly kingdom of God. That's a kingdom perspective. It's as simple as that. But... That is, isn't it, a vast difference from mere religion. That is a real relationship with the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ. It's so important, isn't it, to grasp the difference between mere religion and a real relationship that lives with the living God. Because outwardly often, the kind of morality that God demands of us, it looks to some people as just like religion. And the two things can look very similar outwardly. But no, Jesus says these things could not be more different, even though both of them perhaps do involve obedience to God's commands. You see, religion is all about the dead obedience of works. And God's commands become a killing burden. The whole of life is all about keeping commands. Whereas if you have a relationship with God, it is all about the joyful obedience of faith. And we see that God's commands are about life and for life. They're life-giving commands, not life-sapping commands. It's the difference, remember, between those two different referees in the game of rugby. One who lives for the game and wants it to flow and uses the rules to make a great game. And the other who cares nothing about the spectacle of the game, but is only there to make sure every dot and tittle of the rule book is not transgressed. But God's commands, for those who understand the Lord and know him as a heavenly father... God's commands are sweet, like honey to the taste. And for true kingdom people, the reality of God's wonderful heavenly kingdom has penetrated in that way right to the very heart of our being. And it's taken control of our whole personality, our whole way of thinking. It possesses our control center, our decision-making, our attitudes, 
what Jonathan Edwards called uh, the affections. Again, not just meaning emotions, but every part of us in our thinking, our perspective, our understanding, our motivation, the power of our will. And that's what the Bible means by our hearts, the very nerve center of what makes us tick. And the kingdom perspective has gone deep into our hearts because we have had our eyes opened to understand where our greatest treasure really is. Look at verse 21. Jesus says, you see, it is our treasure that possesses us. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, you see, in this world, our thinking is all about treasure now. That's verse 19, isn't it? Laying up treasures on earth. That is what matters to people. That's what the elections have all been about this week, isn't it? Which party has offered us this treasure or that treasure in order to win our votes? Less council tax, better hospitals, better schools, whatever it might be. I was looking for a party to offer us better weather, but I've definitely voted for them. They can't deliver on that one. But it works, doesn't it? Because whatever we're interested in, we will vote for because we want it, to keep it. Protecting treasures that we already have, perhaps. Or just as likely, wanting to have a bigger slice of what you don't have and what somebody else has. That's what drives a lot of our politics, isn't it? The politics of envy. But you see, despite all of our efforts in all of that, look at verse 19. Jesus says the reality is that all this earthly treasure will in the end decay and fade away. Or it'll be stolen from us ignominiously. I don't know if you've ever had moths. When we lived in London, having moved from Aberdeen, I had a very big cupboard full of uh, woolly jumpers, very necessary up in the northeast of Scotland. I never wore them once, I don't think, the whole time we were in London. But when we moved back to Glasgow the first winter, I went to my cupboard to get them out and start wearing them again, and blow me, the whole lot had been munched by moths. We had a dreadful infestation of the southern moth that came up with us to Glasgow, so it all had to go in the freezer and chemicals had to be sprayed everywhere. It was a rotten business, every single one of them virtually. But that's life, isn't it, in this world? Things get eaten by moths. Or your garden chairs, that when you buy them, they say these can be kept out all year long. It didn't mean in Glasgow. <laughs> and uh, your rust-free chairs, when you go out to sit on them on the one sunny day that comes in the summer, you discover they've actually rusted when they weren't supposed to. That's life in this world, isn't it? Or the thief breaks in and steals it. Some of you have known the misery of and being burgled and what that's like, that's earthly life. Or the, the rust here is probably actually talking about farmers and their crops and big silos of grain that gets tainted with mold and rust. And that's where your wealth is stored and your produce. You go to the barn and it's all useless. Nobody wants to buy it. Plenty of people in recent years have woken up to discover that their pension has been pinched. They thought they were going to have a happy retirement, but no, their company goes bust. And what do you find? Well, the pension fund wasn't funded. And all of a sudden, life's not going to be as good as you hoped it would be. That's earthly life, isn't it? It's in the newspapers every day. It's happening all the time. It's all around us. And friends, even if you might have a charmed life where the moths never get your jumpers and your pension pot is full to brimming and nobody ever steals or breaks into your house, and nothing like that ever happens. In the end, the last great thief is going to come for you. The thief of death. And even if you're not a materialist, some people are not materialists. They're not that interested in wealth and money and gold and possessions and these sort of things. A lot of people, though, are very interested in their body, aren't they? I don't think we've ever lived in an age when there be so many gyms everywhere and people obsessed with exercise and eating, you know, soya beans and sawdust for breakfast and all these sorts of things. <laughs> Ultimately, you will not beat your mortality. It won't be the moths, but it will be the worms when you're six feet under. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. That's life in this world. And Jesus is saying to us, friends, kingdom people are people who see all of that very, very clearly. They see clearly the reality of this earthly transience. But not just that, not just that. They see something 
even more important than that. They see the reality of heavenly permanence. And that is Jesus' first point here in verses 19 and 20. Do you see? Only the kingdom of heaven is real and permanent. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where the thieves do not break in and steal. Heaven is where our true and permanent home really is because, well, because that is where our Father is. We pray, verse 9, to our Father in heaven. We've been praying as a fellowship very much uh, in recent months for our missionary in South America, Roy Murray. And we've been praying, haven't we, very specially that he would have a base, a home. He's having to travel all around the continent. And we're praying that he'd have a home to go back to, a place where he can uh, rest and feel stable uh, uh, and feel as a home. Uh, but I recall some years ago, actually, when Roy was back on home assignment here, uh, talking to him about this. It wasn't that long after his father, Ian, had died. And I remember, I remember Roy saying to me, um, we've lived all over the world in different countries, even as children, as missionaries. And um, in some senses, it always was a strange thing to actually wonder where your home was. But it was always easy for me because home was always where my dad was. But now that my dad has died and gone to heaven, I don't know where my earthly home is. But it makes me even more conscious of where my real home is. And I recall the words of Hudson Taylor, who after his wife died, wrote about her passing and said, it was the blow that for a little while makes the desert more dreary, but heaven more homelike. Heaven more homelike. Because his beloved loved one was now there. And you see, for the Christian believer, our great beloved, our God and Savior, he is our real treasure. And where he is, is where home is, surely. And to have real treasure is to know that we have a home there with him. And kingdom perspective, you see, grasps that. It sees where the real solid joys and the lasting treasures that we were singing about are to be found. And it lives there for the whole of life in that glorious light. Because once you've seen that, well, you can't possibly live any other way, can you? In fact, that is really the test, actually, of whether we've understood the true message of the gospel at all. And so all through this chapter, you will see that there's a contrast between life lived with an earthly eye, an earthly perspective, and life lived with a heavenly perspective, with heavenly sight. And Jesus is challenging us. He is saying, what is really in your heart? And I'll tell you the answer, he says. Your heart and your heart's orientation and your heart's perspective will be found by looking for where your treasure really is. I don't know if you like uh, watching that uh, program, Grand Designs, you know, with Kevin MacLeod and the people are, are building a dream home, usually some extraordinary building in an extraordinary place. Uh, I really quite enjoy it. Perhaps it's because uh, most of my ministry seems to become a building site and a, a building project. But uh, nevertheless, I love that program. And I remember watching one episode some years ago. I forget exactly what the, the project was, but it was a very grand uh, design indeed. And of course, it charts the history and all the ups and downs and the crises and so on. And this family <clears throat> who were uh, building this house were living on that building site in this little old caravan all the way through uh, the renovation. And it was just chaos. And it was a mess, and the caravan was falling apart. And uh, it was an extraordinary thing <coughs> to watch. And yet, that family had the right perspective, didn't they? Because to invest in that caravan, to make that caravan a luxury interior so that their, uh, their time during the building phase would be absolutely wonderful, that would be absolutely ridiculous. The whole point is that that caravan was just temporary. They were living in that caravan for the day when at last they would open the door of their grand design and proper life at last would begin. That's where their heart was, in their ultimate home. That was their treasure. And so they were content to live in chaos, to live with a lot of mess, because they were building for the future. 
And no doubt at the same time, they became increasingly dissatisfied with caravan life and longing more and more for life in the grand design for their true home. And so you see, if the kingdom of heaven is our true home, then it should be the same for us. That from the heart of our being will come the desires and the concerns and the practices of that kingdom, our true home. Because we know, don't we, that only that is permanent. Only that is going to be worth investing our whole life in. And that's what will possess our thinking. That is what will give us our whole outlook on life, a true kingdom perspective. And that will rule the way that we see everything in our earthly life. And it will determine everything that we do in our earthly life. And that's Jesus' second point in verses 22 and 23, you see. If we're true kingdom people, then it will be the desires and the cares of our permanent home, not our temporary home, that will shape our perspective on life in this world. To use uh, Jesus' picture here, we'll see clearly, verse 22, we'll have a healthy eye which will light up our whole outlook on life. In other words, we will think straight. And we'll make right decisions and right judgments with right perspective about this world. We won't have blurred vision, verse 23, darkened vision that makes us confused and befuddled about what's really important in life and what isn't. We'll be people, no, who see everything with the light and clarity of eternity. And when that is so, that means two things. First, it means that what really matters in life is that we are living in God's sight with his view being the thing that really matters. In other words, we know that he alone is our true treasure and he's our rewarder. And therefore, everything that matters in life is only down to what God sees and what God thinks and what God has of us as a valuation, not what this world thinks or anybody else. And that's the refrain if you look all the way through verses 1 to 18. It's our Father who sees even what's done in secret. And it's he who rewards his true children. And so we're living for his eyes and his praise, not for this world's praise. You see it there in verse 4 and verse 6 and verse 18. Each paragraph, it's about what God sees and how God rewards. That's what matters. And so that means that life on this earth for us is not going to be living in other people's sight, caring what their valuations are, worrying what they think of our priorities in life. It's all going to be about what God thinks. What a liberation that is. We live our lives in God's sight. Only his viewpoint matters. And that's what counts in the end. But secondly, a real heavenly perspective means that we will know that we live with God's sight. That is, our eyes also are open to the invisible, to the permanent, to the unseen reality of heaven. And it's that that will give us clear and true perspective on everything that's visible, but which is in fact merely temporary and temporal and earthly. And that will transform the way we view all our earthly relationships in terms of material things, in terms of the judgments that we make about other people, and in terms of the worries and concerns that we have about the future. That is the refrain all through the second part of this section from chapter 6, verse 25 onwards. Our whole lives, you see, Jesus says, are to be illumined with heavenly light. So you don't need to be anxious because you can see and you know that your Father knows you and knows your needs and will provide. And you know that, so you have heaven's perspective. You can live with that heavenly sight. You know that you can seek first the kingdom of God and all the other things that you do need in this earthly life. God will give to you and not deprive you. Now we're going to look at those two things in more detail over the next couple of weeks, but do just notice today Notice Jesus' clear conclusion to all of this talk about perspective. Look at verse 24. It's a third thing and it's vital. It is only when you see clearly, says Jesus, with heaven's true perspective on life on earth. It's only when you see clearly that you can serve faithfully heaven's true purpose for you on this earth. Verse 24, no one can serve two masters. Notice he doesn't say you must not try to serve two masters. He says you cannot serve God and money. Mammon is the old word. The material things. This earthly 
uh, world and all that is passing within it. You cannot serve truly heaven and earth, is what he's saying. Just as you can't sink all your savings into your caravan and into your dream home. You can't. It's impossible. It cannot be done. But you see, the trouble is, friends, the trouble is that often our vision is blurred and we think that we can. Blurred vision is a very dangerous thing. Usually it's a sign of quite serious underlying pathology. It might even be the sign of a, a brain tumor or something. But even the symptoms of blurred vision are dangerous, aren't they? I know that. I wear contact lenses sometimes, and if they move around in my eyes, I get blurred vision. I can't see. That's why I don't wear them when I'm preaching. I get nervous. It's even worse when you're driving, isn't it? It's dangerous to have blurred vision. And see, all too often as Christians, we don't see with the clarity that we ought to. And we have blurred vision, and our eyes are bad. And that leads to disaster. Because it hides what we're not seeing clearly, that there's an underlying pathology in our hearts, that our hearts are actually divided, that we, we think we're being spiritual, but in reality, it so often is earth and not heaven that we're prioritizing in our lives. Isn't that right? Think about your priorities. Think about your priorities for your money, for example. Are you? And am I really investing in our eternal home or just in this temporary caravan a bit too much it can be very subtle can't it think about our children what are we wanting for them what are we investing in for them well often it's it's education it's training and so on isn't it of course that's important don't get me wrong but we need to ask ourselves don't we about our children and our grandchildren what is the chief goal what is the education and the training and all of that for? What's our real dream and desire for them? Is it that they'll, they'll get top marks and, and top exams and top degrees and top jobs and a comfortable life and all the things that we have and even more? And of course we want them to be Christian. But is that perhaps falling into the place of a, an insurance policy so that we can have all of this and, and not lose out eternally? to ask ourselves those questions don't we what are our priorities for our kids is it when they're at school to be full of sports full of friends full of a great social circle full of all sorts of things or is it the growth and training in Christ's way in Christ's church prioritizing the things that will do that for our young folk many many Christian parents you know many many Christian parents really don't like the idea very much if one of their children wants to go into full-time Christian work in ministry or mission or something like that. I've met many in their applications for Cornhill or apprenticeships who have Christian parents who are not at all keen on that particular path in life that they're taking. That says something about where their treasures are, doesn't it? And we could have hundreds and hundreds of of other examples what about our time well hobbies leisure holidays all of these things nothing wrong with them they're they're necessary they're good but are these things serving our chief purpose of serving the church of our Lord Jesus Christ or are they getting in the way and actually hampering and preventing that do weekend breaks rank a lot higher up the, uh, the, the, the pole than weekend hospitality for new Christians for young students for internationals and so on what are our priorities how clear or how blurred is our vision well Jesus says listen let me speak very clearly you can't serve earth and heaven you'll end up as he says in verse 24 despising one or the other and usually alas it means despising heaven which of course means despising God himself and that's why we need real kingdom perspective because only that perspective only that healthy eye will fill our minds and our hearts with the true light of reality that our treasure is our master and it will either be earth or heaven it can't be both and if it is earth, we will be people who are enslaved to the things of earth, won't we? No matter how spiritual we think we are or other people think we are, we'll be possessed by earthly things. 
And we'll be seeking these treasures. And that's what will make us people who are full of worries and anxieties about life. That is what will make us people who are driven because we're being driven really for earthly treasures. By contrast, if it's heaven that really does master us, well, we'll be people who see that it's God that we serve and that he's the God of grace, that he's the God who loves us and who gives us all that we need for both earth and heaven. Then we'll be people that are freed from all these kind of worries and anxieties of earthly concerns. We'll be liberated, won't we, from worrying about what other people's attitudes are to us. In Jesus' words, our whole existence will actually be flooded with light, not darkness. That contrast is absolute. It's stark. It's heaven or earth. It's God or mammon. It's light or dark. It's belief or it's unbelief. But well, which side of those is really true of your heart and my heart? Jesus helps us in these chapters to examine ourselves as he applies that principle to us throughout the rest of the chapter, looking at our devotional lives, looking at our daily lives, and saying what really is the driving force. But today let's just leave ourselves pondering his words and considering our own perspective on life. Is it really the clear sight, the perspective of the kingdom of heaven that fills us with light? Or is it in practice, no matter what we say we believe and say we do, is it in practice more like the blurred vision of this world's sight? It's a really important question, isn't it, for you and for me. Because Jesus means what he says in verse 24. No one can serve two Masters, either he will hate one and love the other or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, it sobers us to be reminded that you are the God who sees all, who sees in secret who sees the deepest recesses of our hearts and who knows every motivation of our heart so that even the good deeds that we do in your name, you know whether we are doing them for ourselves or truly for you. So often, Lord, our vision is blurred. So often the ways of this world crowd in upon us. How we need you to lead us every day by the light of your life-giving word. How we need one another to keep us to the path that is the only pathway of light, living in the light of your glorious coming and your kingdom. So Lord, help us and help us to help one another that together we might be led by your heavenly light And be people who in all things are shaped by a true kingdom perspective. That our hearts might be yours always and forever. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as we close the words of number 722, which is a prayer. Jesus, be first in everything, our Savior, risen Lord. Jesus, the one alone supreme, be everywhere adored. Verse 5, Jesus, be first in word and deed, in thought and motive too. Fulfill your purpose in our hearts, creating all things new. Number 722.
And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.